Well, good evening. My name is Harry Waring, and welcome to another edition of Homegrown here on LTV. It's uh, an honor and a privilege to sit down with some incredibly talented artists on the east end of Long Island, and it's a chance to get to know them a little bit and kind of dive deep into their stories of where they came from, how they wound up to be East End residents, because everyone has a story. Not many grow up here, out here, uh, but they come from all over the world, and tonight is no exception. Uh, welcome our, our, I guess, Montauk resident right now, Simon <laughs> Kirk. How are you? I'm fine, Harry. Thanks for having me. This is an honor. Yeah. There's so much that we could talk about tonight, and I want to get into a whole bunch of different things, but I guess I want to ask, how long have you been an East End resident? I've been coming out to Long Island since uh, '95. When uh, I moved over with my family from uh, from England, and um, a, a mutual friend of ours, Mick Jones from Foreigner, uh, said you have to come out to the Hamptons and see the. We went to Bridgehampton. Yeah. He had a, a a friend who had a house, uh, Kathleen Turner, the uh, actress, and I fell in love with the place. I loved it. And um, the following year, we we bought a house out in East Hampton, and I've been coming back and forth ever since. I know you've been holed up in Montauk the past yeah. few months, uh, since I guess March, when everything yeah. kind of shut down. What have you been busy doing? I know there's a lot of different projects. Well, I have a, a, a little home studio, and uh, I've been involved with this uh, band in England called Lone Rider, you know, while bad companies yeah. off the road, obviously. And um, I've been I did a, a virtual album with them. Uh, they sent me all the tracks and with the uh, the click track, and they're really good. Uh, uh, amazing singer, Steve Overland and Steve Morris, who plays guitar. I scored a little movie, uh, an independent movie called Sunset Boulevard. Had you done that before? Or? No, and it's something I've always wanted to do. I, I I I really want to get into it as I get older and my you know my performing years <laughs> start to wane. I I love. Uh, scoring movies so that's something i really like to do i've been writing songs with uh, some friends in nashville and uh new york all on zoom god bless <laughs> zoom and um that's about it really you've been keeping very busy i yeah. i know you have uh, some ties to a lot of local artists that are out here and artists that are g.e smith and Leroy bell just yeah. put out the album stony hill and you, you played on their record how did that come about ah well g.e called me about 18 months ago and said i've just met this great singer from uh, Seattle, mm. and uh, we're putting together an album. Would would I like to play drums? I said I'd, I'd love to, but because I love G and I love his playing, and then he sent me some demos with Leroy singing. I said, "Well, I'm I'm in <laughs> uh, twofold because uh, Leroy had such a great voice and great songs. The whole thing about him was was kind of different. Yeah. It wasn't like your average." blues soul singer it was uh, some songs were polit politically um oriented but he had just had such a lovely gentle vibe about him and i we i, I went to g's house uh in amagansett we met we uh rehearsed in his basement for about four hours and did a show at the talk house a couple of days later I know you've also done it earlier this year. It seems like years ago when there were concerts. Yeah. Um, but I think at the, the beginning of the year, you were part of the Fireside Sessions with Nancy Atlas. How, ah. how did you meet her and, and get involved? I met Nancy a few years ago um, through a friend of ours, uh, Mike Mazzaracco, great engineer and guitarist, yeah. and said, you have to see this girl. She's an amazing singer, and she's at the talk house. And I went down there, and there she was in the middle of a set. And of course, it's such a small place. She, yeah. I kind of stood there like, wow, what a great singer. And she recognized me and like sort of blanched. And then I, I played a little, I jammed with her at the Surf Lodge in Montauk. And then we did the Fireside Show in the Bay Street Theater, Sag Harbor in January. Wow. What, I guess back in 95, what brought you to New York? Was there a reason you chose, because LA, New Good York? Good question. Uh, well, LA was too far. Yeah. Um, my parents were still alive. I still had family in England and I didn't want to move that far away. Um, I, I've been touring America since 1969. Yeah. So I, I, New York is pretty familiar to me. And uh, my wife, uh, uh, my then wife at the time, we've, since we'd uh, divorced, um, but there were good schools here. Yeah. The whole thing was, was, was perfect for us. And we were only six hours away from England yeah. Should something come up, you know? You really have become a, a true New Yorker, which is interesting. <laughs> and why I say that is there's a story out there, and we'll get into Free and Bad Company in a little bit. I kind of want to go back to your 
uh, when you first started in music. But I'm curious how you became a driver for the Red Cross oh. after 9-11. Because oh, that, wow. that story stuck out to me because that is the quintessential New Yorker. To, You've done to, your homework. To do that, because it was just such a great story. Well, yeah, obviously, I was here in, in 9-11. Out of a uh, horrible tragedy, of course. Yeah, but yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, I still think about it most days. I, I was here, and I witnessed it and, and the whole thing. But ironically, being even though I'm from England, uh, it happened in 2001. I had been in this city mm. for six years. And actually, New York is quite simple. It's a grid. North, mm. South, East, West, with a few suburbs thrown in. So it's not really that hard to navigate compared with London, which <laughs> is a nightmare. So when I heard that um, the Red Cross were looking for drivers, yeah. I, I volunteered and um, I, I tried to inject a little bit of humor when, when I, I passed the whatever exam, the questionnaire, and the first crew that I picked up from what they called the pile, which was yeah. the, uh, the, the, uh, the rubble, of the World Trade Center, there were seven firemen and construction men um, who'd been up all night. Yeah. And they all congregated in the van. And I walked and said, does anyone know where that we're going? <laughs> in my Cockney accent. Yeah. They all went, who the hell? <laughs> I said, guys, don't worry. I know I have all the addresses where you're going. And I just want to welcome you and thank you for your service. So, yeah, I did some driving for about six weeks, wow. uh, and uh, it was uh, – I can't really – I could spend a whole hour telling you stuff. No, but, it was an, an yeah. incredible time. I remember I worked in the city at the time, and you would see missing posters uh, everywhere yeah, yeah. and firehouses with pictures and that people had lost. And it was – so, in a way, thank you for doing that. That's such a yeah. cool story and wow. to, to do that. Now, I guess after New York, well, let's go back kind of the beginning um, when you were, I guess, just a – a teenager, um, when did you first really start getting involved in music? Because I know you grew up in kind of a rural Very. area. <laughs> the, the, the American equivalent of, I guess, or the English equivalent rather, of sort of Northwest Idaho. <laughs> it was very, very rural and um, had to walk to school, you know, no electricity, running water for uh, quite a few years. Um, and I was listening to I uh, had a little transistor radio with an earpiece, and I listened to uh, a station called Radio Luxembourg, which was in near Belgium. Yeah. And it would broadcast all this different music than, that we were getting in England, which was very middle of the road, you know, boring stuff. And they would broadcast stuff like Marvin Gaye, James Brown, Otis Redding. And I was transfixed by it. And um, it was around about the same time that the Beatles happened in 63. Okay. They happened more here in 64, but 63 they hit England. And that really woke me up. And uh, I wanted to be a drummer. I mean, I guess it, it started when we first got our TV, our very first TV. And one of the first programs I saw in black and white <laughs> was um, a big band series called All That Jazz, okay. featuring big bands, yeah. swing bands. And um, I was transfixed by the drummer. I was just blown away by what this drummer was doing. And um, that's what I wanted to be. And 55 years later, I'm still doing it. Did you um, did you play other instruments at the time? I played, or just... No, not at the time, no. Um, I was just a drummer, drummer, drummer. And <laughs> I started guitar thanks to a judge in, in in our hometown, in my little village, our neighbors were complaining because I had this little drum kit and I was making <laughs> such a noise that they complained to the police. And the police took my case to a court and there was a judge there. I was too young to go. My father went for me. And the judge said, this boy must learn his homework. He's allowed to practice half an hour a day only when he's done his homework. And that's that was, and he banged the gavel and that was the ruling. So I could only play drums for half an hour. And my brother had a guitar. He was in the army and he'd come back from Germany, he left this guitar in my bedroom when he came back yeah, again. Yeah. And I started picking it up because once the 30 minutes was up and I had to stop playing drums, I had to play something. So I picked up the guitar and I've, I've been playing it as long as I've been playing drums. You were in such a raw area. and I'd imagine you were kind of looking to get out of there as fast oh, as possible yeah. and to kind of explore. When did you get to when did you get to London and kind of figure I, a way well, to... I, I was originally from London and, okay. and then we left 
okay. so I was a city kid. Yeah. I transplanted to the country. And then when I, when I was about 17, that's when I, I wanted to leave school. Okay. 16, actually. I wanted to leave school and go down to London and, and try my hand at, uh, you know, being a pop star. <laughs> and I'm, my parents made a deal with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I stayed on for another two years and get what we call A-levels, advanced levels, um, exams, it gives you a better chance of getting into university rather than O-levels, which are ordinary levels. <laughs> it's a, a different system over here. But if I had enough A-levels, I could get in, into a good university. So they said to me, stay until you're 18, and that was like a bloody, <laughs> like a prison sentence. But I did what they asked, and then they said, uh, and then we'll give you two years to try whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to go to London and, and try and be a musician, you've got two years. And if nothing happens after two years, at least you have good grades, yeah. you can go to university. Now, Harry, I've got to the tell you. The clock was ticking. I, yeah, the I, clock I was imagine ticking as soon as that. And nothing happened for 23 months. <laughs> it's always the way. The 24. And on the, the 24th month, I got the break. Had you thought about what else you wanted to do yeah. as far as if you went to school? I wanted or? to be a photojournalist. Okay. I'm crazy about photography. It's artistic. I loved, and it's, yeah. yeah. And uh, reporting. And I wanted to be a journalist and a photojournalist. So I was all prepared to, uh, you know, nothing had happened. I had answered auditions and it had come to nothing. And um, then on the the last couple of weeks of my 24 months, uh, it's, and it's a true story, there was a band called the Black Cat Bones playing across London, uh, way across London, a 40-minute subway ride away. And I, I decided I'd love to go and see them because I'd heard they were really good. They had a great guitarist. But it was a long way away, so I tossed a coin, <laughs> and it came down heads, and I got on the subway, and I went to see this band, and it changed my life because this band had the guitarist Paul Kossoff, yeah. who was uh, – then he was only about 15 or 16. The band weren't very good, but he was blistering. He was amazing. And they were playing in this little pub, and uh, during the break, uh, they had two 45-minute sets. During the break, uh, he came down off the stage and I said, mate, you really are an amazing. He said, oh, thank you very much. Can I buy you a drink? La, la, la. <laughs> and I said, by the way, I don't think your drummer's very good. I don't know what made me say that. He wasn't very good, but, you know. I'd, and it was the one time where I was really kind of pushy. Well, you had, we had about a month left or a couple I had months. About a you, month you were, you were going to do what you needed to do. He said, Well, it's funny you should say that because tonight is his last night <laughs> and we're holding auditions tomorrow in this pub. So if you want to come along, yeah. come along. Wow. And I, and I did. And I played two songs with them and I got the job. What, what was when you flipped the coin? Was heads go, tails, or heads uh, go, it? or tails stay at home and write a letter home? How long were you in that band, and then when did free start after that? Because I think it was like a six months. Or? I think we were only about six months, and then Paul, we I became very friendly with Paul. I was this out of town kid, this wet behind the ears country kid, and Paul kind of took me under his wing, and uh, I stayed with him in his apartment. Um, you know, I got very friendly, and then he came to me one afternoon and said, "Listen." I'm kind of tired of playing in the same old blues, yeah. boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, you know, that sort of boring stuff. Uh, I've met this singer from uh, another band called Brown Sugar uh, called Paul Rogers, and uh, I jammed with him. I jammed with Don't Tell the Others. <laughs> I jammed with him. It was fantastic. And we want to get together tomorrow uh, and jam. Would you like to come along? So I went with Paul Kossoff to this house in North London, and I met Paul Rogers, we jammed, and uh, that was three quarters of free. Wow. How old were you when you first joined that, uh, when, when free started? It was, you were uh, like 18. We started in 68, I was 19. Wow. And how old was, because uh, you had a 50, I, how did, I guess it was Andy, Andy Fraser. Yeah. Andy Fraser he, was the he baby. He was 15. Well, we needed a bass player, and we didn't really know who to get. But luckily, we had this. We knew this guy called Alexis Corner, who was like he was like the godfather of the British blues scene. Yeah. And uh, Mick Taylor had played with him. Mick Jagger, Charlie, Jack Bruce, a lot of people were, who went on to more famous bands mm. have been through the school of Alexis Corner. And he said, "I know this kid, and he's a kid who's an amazing player. He's just uh, been uh, playing with John Mayle." 
the the blues legend. Uh, and wait for it, he's only 15. I said, what? I mean, I was 19. Uh, Paul Rogers was six months younger than me. Kossoff was a year younger than me. So you got 18, 19, 19. 15? This kid's 15. He said, trust me, go and see him. So we all went down to this club in London, and there was Andy Fraser, and he was phenomenal. Oh. He was absolutely amazing. It amazes me because you guys were all so young, yeah. really, and you started with the band um, with, with Free, and, and everything got together. I'm curious, how did your drumming style develop as you were? Because no you had just started. All right, so it seems like now you got together Paul Rogers and the band. It seemed like it was starting to to come together and, and, yes. and work a little bit. Your parents probably were a little bit more relieved. They were relieved. At, at that point. My, my mum was certainly relieved. My dad, yeah. <laughs> so but, anyway, yeah. But as a drummer, how did that, how did you develop, who were you watching? I, I heard that you were influenced by Al Jackson from oh. Booker T. Where did, like, where did it all come from? When Because at that age, I'd imagine you're not mimicking, no, but you're, you're trying well, to figure out who you are. When, when you start out, Harry, with anything, you get influenced yes. or copy or what, plagiarize or whatever, but <laughs> you assimilate all these different styles. Mm. And here was me. I'd only been playing a few years. I was listening to Ringo, Charlie Watts, discovered Al Jackson, who became my northern star, as it were, my number one influence. Keith Moon, John. I hadn't really heard of uh, Zeppelin yet. Excuse me. But I had this amalgam of styles. And you can hear it on our first album, Tons of Sobs. I, was, I wasn't playing like I play now. Yeah. I was still trying to find my own thing. And it wasn't until the third album that Free played on uh, that we released called Fire and Water that I discovered my, my style. It just, it all slotted together when I was about 21. Uh, and then I sort of built on that. There was no blinding light. Yeah. It just happened. One day I woke up and I'm this simple, solid uh, player. Ringo had a big in effect on me, actually. And mm -hmm. when I got to play with him many years later, we fitted so well together, you know, two drummers playing yeah. together. Um, and I, I was off the bat, I said, Ringo, you've been a huge influence on me and um yeah that third record obviously changed your life um and in the way that the band um the trajectory that it just took off with that with the song um if i'm not mistaken that the third record was self-produced right or was that uh, it first the third the third or sorry third record. edit point the first <laughs> the third record was the was third record fire right? and water was, was produced by a guy called john kelly okay who had a pseudonym a pseudonym for chris blackwell he was actually the head of Ireland Records. Okay. I, I mean, the, the it's, term... It felt as a band, you were kind of coming together. Yeah. You knew, what, we, you knew uh, who you were as a band in that we third record. We did. And, and that was our story, really, from even through Bad Company. We, we never actually had a producer, per yeah. se. We did need someone in free in the first couple of records because we were so young. Mm -hmm. And Chris, um, when he first heard All Right Now, it was six minutes long. And we're going, yeah, and he said, it's great, but it's, it's too bloody long. You're going to have to make an edit. And we went, no, 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 no. He said, otherwise, it'll never get on radio. No one's going to play a six-minute song. And he was right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that took off, and all of a sudden, you're invited to these huge festivals, the Isle of Wild. And what was that like as God. being a teenager, early 20s, to go from literally a couple months away from being a, a photographer to performing in front of all that, and that's a great profession, but being all of a sudden you are, you're the one getting all the pictures taken of and yeah. meeting all these cool people that you grew up listening to. And <laughs> What do they say? Be careful what you wish for. Well, it was, by the time we got to the Isle of Wight, we actually did two Isle of Whites, uh, oh. but the really, really big one was when we just had the hit All Right Now. But by the time we got there, we'd done probably a couple of hundred shows. So we were a really tight-knit yeah. unit. Um, and even though I, I look at myself playing drums at the Isle of Wight, I was so hot, I was out of breath, I was so frantic, and I was much less controlled as a drummer than I am now. I have to be careful. Uh, but I was really going crazy. And and what I learned about playing in those days to those huge crowds, and you've got to remember there were no monitors. And back in those days, there were no monitors. Yeah. We have monitors here. There's one under this <laughs> desk. 
four feet from me. Yeah. But back in those days, we had to rely solely on the balance that we achieved in our amps and, and, mm -hmm. and how we interacted between the four of us. So you play to the first 10 rows. Mm -hmm. That's what you play for. Don't ever try and play yeah. to the back of a half a million crowd. You're never going to do it. Uh, but it was a learning curve, you know. That song you mentioned in the past was a blessing and mm. – I don't say curse, but what was it like to then get in the studio? You had this huge song um, to get in and do the next record and to trust yourselves enough to – because I'd imagine it gets in your head a little bit where, all right, we're, we're, we're big. We got to top this one. What's that like? Hard. Yeah. Especially being so young. And, and I won't go on too much, but I think we were slightly mishandled. Um, we, we gave off this air – that we were a really tough bunch of kids. We were kids, but yeah. we really, you know, we were. We knew what we were doing. But when All Right Now hit, it hit like a, a sucker punch. I mean, it was huge. And, uh, you know, obviously Island Records were saying, hey, this is great. Instead of playing an, a town tomorrow, you're playing in Belgium. <laughs> or the day after you're in Holland, then we're going to Austria, then we're going to America, la, la. It opened up this huge, it opened up the world. Mm. Then we had to follow it up. And really, we had no intention of being this pop band. Yeah. You know, we just, we wanted a song that would lift people, make them dance, something different to the, you know, the sort of the mm. free, medium paced rhythms that, that we attach to our songs. We wanted some dump. Gong, 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 people, you know. Yeah. But when it came to following it up, we couldn't. I mean, we, we released uh, the song called The Stealer, which was great, but it just wasn't made for AOI. It just wasn't that, that all right now type music. The album flopped, the single flopped, and here we were at the age of 20, 21, and he was still only 17, <laughs> and we'd had our first flop. Yeah. And it hit us really hard, and that's when the first crack appeared in the band. And uh, w coupled with the, the workload that w was suddenly thrust upon us, uh, Paul and Andy, Paul Rogers and Andy, decided to you know break the band up. Yeah, and it seems like a lot happened in the span of a couple five of years. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it's interesting because I, I would think to myself, oh, wow, they're on their next record and their live record. But no, it was all just in a span of a couple of years. Free was from 68 until 72, yeah. so four years. And we packed a lot in, but we also packed a, a lot of drama in. Uh, Paul Kossoff never really got over that first breakup. Because here we were, we were we were on a rise. It was we people loved us, and there's still a lot of affection for free now yeah. in England. Not quite so much in America, but in, especially in in England. And um, Paul and Andy, they wanted to go, you know, their own separate musical ways. Mm -hmm. And it was it was tough on me and Koss. We called him Koss because <laughs> having two Pauls in the band. Uh, Koss was Paul Kossoff. Uh, we took it very hard, and Koss started taking solace in uh, in drugs, yeah. and uh, he never really recovered. Was it tough? It, and what I've read, you kind of got the band back together to help him. Yeah, but I don't know. That has that's a lot of pressure oh. to to be able to. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's for the right reasons, but it's it, it was for no. To... No, that's a very good point, Harry. Uh, it, it was for a noble cause. I mean, what we know about drink and drugs today and recovery and addiction, we, it just was not known yeah. back in 1971 when cost was really, really bad. And and instead of taking him off to rehab, you know, we decided to reform. And, of course, when he came back in, he, his his chops were not good. He was shaking. He was, he was in a really bad state. And we should never have really yeah. um, taken off the way we did, but we we knuckled down and and we got through a couple of tours, and but it just got worse and worse. And um, you know, in uh, about a year later, late '72, uh, he had a, an epileptic fit, and um, by '73, uh, we'd all had enough, yeah. and so we broke up for the second time. 
We're chatting with Simon Kirk. Uh, so much to chat about. I want to get into Bad Company in just a little bit, mm. but would you mind doing a song? Let's, uh... Yeah, I'll do a song. I mean, I I started writing, I wrote the, one of the first songs that I wrote that uh, Free did. Mm. Uh, Paul, and it's very hard when you're writing, uh, when you're presenting a song to Paul and Andy who, who write these beautiful songs. Um, but I, I came up with this, and I'll play most of it. I don't want to, I'll, I'll give you a little snippet. Great. But it's called uh, Love You So. And by the way, before you go, I just want to say, yeah, I love you so. If it's goodbye, Maybe for good I'm not gonna cry Maybe I should And I Oh, I love you Oh, how these years Have slipped away we shed no tears, so why today? And all this time has made me feel Love is no crime, and love is real And I Simon Kirk here on Homegrown on LTV. Was it intimidating? I get the sense it might have been when you, did you write a lot of songs at the time and present them? <laughs> was it, because you hear the story of Dave Grohl and, and Kirk Cobain saying, and Dave basically was like, I'm not going to bother him with my music and show him my songs. <laughs> was it difficult to? Well, it, it was, yes, it was intimidating. Um, and I've struggled outside of the drum kit. I've struggled for a long time about presenting songs because I just don't think they were good enough until someone told me, you know, a long time ago, you know what, they really are good songs. Yeah. And and I, I, I it, it's how you present them. If if you go in all <laughs> bluster and say, hey, guys, listen, I've got this I've got our next hit. song there, and it falls flat, Damn. then you feel like a real prat, <laughs> an idiot. So I gently... And when I played that, uh, Paul Rogers said, oh, it's great. And my God, the hairs stood up on my forearms when he said that. And he sung it so well. Um, and he, he used it on one of his solo albums. So that really, Harry, that meant so much to me. I imagine, yeah. Um, and he's, he's also a bloody good drummer. <laughs> Paul funny, Rogers. Funny how that works. It's funny how it works. I want to get into Bad Company a little bit yeah. and the kind of the beginning. How did how did it start uh, with you and Paul oh, and getting funny. together and kind of figuring out your next move? Because getting back together story. with Free kind of wrapped up. But. Yeah, I was so glad to say goodbye to Free. I mean, oh, it really was uh, a torch torture at the wow. end um we tried different variations <laughs> different musicians etc cetera, etc cetera, until we just let go and i went off to brazil this was in um uh, christmas or january of 1973 i went down to brazil i had a, um, a girlfriend down there and i stayed there for a couple of months just chilling and yeah. forgetting about everything and I came back, um, I think around March, and I called Paul Rogers up. I said, "Hey, you know, how are you doing? We've always gotten on well. Yeah. You know, we never, never really um, 
uh, had a bad word to say about each other. And he said, oh, well, I've done this, you know, I did this tour with my band called Peace. And we backed, uh, we opened up for Mott the Hoople. And I've, this guy, this guitarist is so funny, he's so nice, Mick Ralphs, and he wants to leave Mott the Hoople and form a band, you know, would you like to play drums? And I've kind of heard of Mott the Hoople, you know, all the young dudes, but they never really were on my, excuse me, never, yeah. never really on my radar. Uh, but he said he's a really good player and he's so nice. And that really, for me, you know, B.B. King said a great thing. He said, playing with geniuses is a real pain. They're hard work. Geniuses are hard work. You just want someone who's in tune and can play well and you get on with. Yeah. And he's right. And so I met Mick and Paul at, at, at Paul's house uh, in Surrey and um, just outside London. And I liked Mick immediately. We, we got on so well. And um, that was it. That was the three quarters of Bad Company. And then we needed a, a bass player. Why are they so bloody hard to find, bass players? And then the search started for bass players. We, we interviewed 16 16 bass players, and the very last person was Boz Burrell, who was playing in King Crimson. And the reason he was at the bottom of the list was we never really liked progressive jazz rock. It wasn't our thing. Yeah. Um, I'd never heard of him, but he was the last guy on the list. And uh, Roger Hodgson, who went on to form Supertramp, he was... He came and went. We 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 uh, interviewed him, but he didn't make the grade. Sorry, Rog, <laughs> but you did all right. And Boz Burrell, um, he came down to the rehearsal, and the first thing he did is said, "Well, let, let's get to know each other. Let's all go to the pub." We didn't even start playing, and he mm. wanted to go and have a drink, and we did. We had a couple of drinks, and we came back. And what I liked about Boz was instead of uh, us giving him chords. He said, no, I don't bother with chord sheets. Yeah. Uh, no, just play it and I'll follow along. And he was great. He was a great vibe and uh, he was a very good player. It's interesting how you go from this huge band in England um, to another huge band. Um, I mean, it's very rare that that actually happens. What was it like working with Paul, going on the road in this second incarnation of your career? I'd imagine there's some moments in the middle section where you weren't sure where you were going. Um, what was it like to kind of get get this new lease on, on oh, life? It was great. It was, I st I've said before and I'll say it again that the first – three or four, four years of Bad Company were the happiest, yeah. the best of my career. They really, uh, from Free and Bad Company. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple, the first year in Free where it all started to click was lovely. We were like a little gang. But the first four years where Bad Company, uh, under the, the guidance of Peter Grant, uh, Led Zeppelin's mm -hmm. new label, it was a perfect storm. We were still in our uh, mid twenties. Well, you were older too. I feel like you yeah. had learned some yeah. lessons from Free, oh, yeah. and you we were able to actually kind of put it together and and probably be the the best version, so to speak. It, of, it, of your... it was. We we'd all come from. Boz had been kicked out of King Crimson. Mick Rouse had left Mott the Hoople. Uh, he didn't want to play with Ian Hunter anymore. Me and Paul had, had left Free, which had been so traumatic yeah. the last twelve or eighteen months. So here we were. Uh, in a house in Headley Grange in Sussex with all this gear, playing songs that we'd all written. You know, I co-wrote Bad Company. Mm. I mean, I suddenly mm. I was in on the writing mix yeah. and we were happy. I, I mean, ironically, we were as free <laughs> as we were ever going to be. It was a, a wonderful, uh, the first few years of Bad Company were wonderful. When did things start to change when Paul, you know, obviously when Paul left, but what kind of preceded that? Well, I, I can only speak for myself, but really around about um, the fourth album, we, we were on this carousel of album tour, album tour, album mm. tour. And it was like, Jesus Christ, we just need a break. And we'd come to do the album Burning Sky in uh, France. And then we really didn't have a lot of material. I think we had three and a half songs. <laughs> and we, we, we were under contract to produce yeah. an album. And when you have a deadline, it kind of screws up your, you know, 
your creative process. So we all got together in uh, um, Aeroville, Pontoise, just outside Paris, and we were looking at each other going, what the hell are we doing here? You know, I don't really have anything. So a lot of stuff was written, uh, you know, in the studio. The the upshot was the album wasn't very good and it kind of got panned in England. Yeah. And that was the first time it was like, oh, God, we need a break. Okay. We really need a break. And I started getting into drink and drugs. Uh, I, it's no secret that, you know, I'm in recovery. Um, but back in 1976, when I was 27, you know, we were all pretty hammered. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started to take its toll on us. And then... We, we managed to keep it together, really, until 1980. And 1980 was the worst year in rock and roll when Lennon was shot, yeah. John Bonham yeah. died. Bad Company were really on the ropes. And um, there was a fist fight. Yes. And uh, we just we just broke up and uh, it never really recovered. You are the, the one constant over what's, <laughs> I guess it's coming for up. For better on, or for worse. Coming up on 50 years. <laughs> do, you, um, do you regret, because you stuck around through a lot of different changes. Um, what, was it hard on your relationship with Paul who had left? Because yeah. you guys were such good friends. Through yeah, it was. It was. But, I mean, we're such different people now. You know, Paul, I, I'm very... Um, uh, uh, impulsive, and I, you know, for better or for worse, I yeah. say things that just pop out. And I did say some things back in the day where you know I was mad, I was angry at Paul because he left the band and he left the door open. And we've been sitting around, me and Mick and Boz were sitting around saying, You oh, know, when's he going to come back? When's he going to come back? So this gulf opened up between Paul and the yeah. other three. And then our manager called up and said, get another singer. <laughs> you got this great band. Um, why don't you get another singer and just carry on? And it was like, wow, really? Do you think we could? Well, we, yeah, we did. Yeah. And we got in Brian Howe. And it was not a good move. Uh, we sold millions of albums. Yeah. He was not the right singer to carry on Paul's legacy, looking back on it. We didn't get on as as uh, people. Uh, I didn't take to him. He was a hard worker, I'll give him that. And he was yeah. a good singer in that heavy metal vein. Uh, but after, God, seven years we were together, um, we we parted ways. And and that, that incarnation of Bad Company was not really the, a very good one, in my opinion. You have um, kept the name alive, so to speak, in literally over the past 50 years that I think it's coming up in a few where you'll celebrate that. Uh, you've played with so many different people, and I mm. want to kind of transition to this. And, I, and I'm curious because you mentioned, and I guess we'll start because you mentioned Bob Marley have, have you ever, <laughs> earlier, and because you said you had a good story about that. I'm curious, go, when did you meet Bob? I never, and, never played with him, okay. but obviously Bob Marley was on, was on Island Records, uh, and when Free uh, was on Island Records, Chris Blackwell, the head of Island Records, who became very friendly with him, said, I've got this band um, called Bob Marley and the Whalers, and um, I want to bring them over to America. And he, he played me a couple, played us a couple of the songs. And it was this, had this great sexy beat, but it wasn't like rock and roll. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know what? Give it a shot. Who knows? So... Long story short, I went over to, to Jamaica. Uh, Chris invited me to stay over there, and um, he said, you have to meet them. You've got to meet Bob Marley. And the, they like free. They've yeah. heard free. And we, so he gave me the address, and I went up there, and I walked into this compound. It's in Kingston, Jamaica, <laughs> on Hope Road. And as soon as I walked into this door, through this door, I heard this, Papa was a rolling stone. <laughs> Wherever he laid his hat. But it was in this reggae, yeah. reggae grew. I thought, wow, that's great. It must be a record. And uh, and then I opened this door and this waft of <laughs> marijuana smoke came out billowing. And there they were, Bob Marley and the Whalers in this basement playing Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Anyway, Chris was there and he said, you know. Uh, so at the end of the song, Chris introduced me to Bob, and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. It was, 
It was this strange dialect. Anyway, they passed me this joint, which was about the size of my forearm. And I was like, you know, I'm high enough from just breathing the air. You know? But Chris whispered, he said, look, you got to do it. This is, they're Rastafari and, <laughs> You're here, yeah. and it's an offer of peace and la la. So anyway, I took this thing, this Olympic torch and uh, had a few tokes and I think I woke up the next day and I found I'd I'd been married to a tree. You have you have <laughs> met so many different people. I heard a story where you were at the Isle of Wight, where it was a Pete Townsend that knocked on your window uh, or, and said something. So you've you, yeah. you had all these experiences with these <laughs> artists. Um, who did you enjoy most playing with when you got a chance? Like when you were going th- when you were kind of rising in your career. Was there certain like a bucket list you have where you're like, all right, I really want to play with Buddy Guy, or I really want oh. to play with you know? Well, I did Ray Charles, play with Buddy, or... and I did well. Ooh, well, I've always wanted to play with the Stones. I love the Stones. I'm, I'm very friendly with Ronnie Wood, one of my dear friends, and I actually did get to play with them at a, a rehearsal. Oh, wow. Charlie, well, here's how about this for a list. Ian Stewart was someone they called the sixth stone. He was the piano player with the stones. He had a heart attack and he passed away. And they held a wake for him in London at the the, the 100 Club in Oxford Street. And this was the band, all the stones, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, um, Pete Townsend, and the stones. Well, when I got there, Charlie, who was driving from hundreds of miles away in the winter, was late. And Ronnie came up to see, would, you, that, would you sit in? That's I great. said, are you, excuse me, would you, are you kidding? Of course. So I played for about 45 minutes with this sublime band. We did all the honky tonk women, Harlem shuffle. And I don't know, it was just, and then Charlie walked in, still got snow on his eyebrows. And I gave him the stick. He said, no, no, I'm going to have That's a drink. Great. Yeah, keep playing. So that that was really um, I, that ticked all my boxes straight away. I did play with Buddy Guy in Chicago, and it was a little bit of a letdown. He was in a very um, strange mood because he said, "Here's this young kid." I said, "What? Young kid from London? This is only four years ago. I'm 71." <laughs> and so I was 65 or 67. And he said, uh, "Anyway, so we started this slow blues. I mean, it was so slow." And I'm playing delicately. He turns around and goes, quieter. What? Quieter. Okay. <laughs> dun, like... dun, tch, dun, dun. Quieter. Not so loud. And I'm doing like side stick. I'm not even hitting the snare drum. So he was kind of playing with me. And uh, he was quite genial, but it, it was not, you know. Yeah, they say never meet your heroes or your idols sometimes. And it, sometimes. And, and, but sometimes they surprise you. Um, once I'm curious, as you as you were rising in your career and like you say, developing your style with Free, there's so many different drummers and bands out there. Um, I know that you met Ginger Baker, and I think you were on tour uh, with them for a, a few different times with sure. Blind Faith, I think, in New York Blind initially. Yeah. Um, what was your interaction like with him? Did you... Is it tough to kind of because you had access to all these amazing musicians? I would try to try like learn something from them, or try, but I don't know what I would say. I feel like I would just be like, "Hey, how's it going?" and not say anything. <laughs> what was it like to be so young and meet Ginger Baker and and talk to him? And did you get a chance to actually kind of? I, well, I did and I didn't because he was such a crusty old bugger. That's um, this was back in nineteen seventy. I was twenty one. I guess Ginger was about seven or eight years older. So anyway, but he was, oh, he was hard work. But I have to say this for him. When we toured with Blind Faith, they only had about 30, 35 minutes worth of material. Mm -hmm. And they honestly should never have gone out because I feel that they shortchanged every crowd that they played to. Um, But who saved the night? Every night was Ginger because he did a 10 minute solo. And he was really an amazing drummer. Uh, but not, no, not a very nice guy. Um, Charlie, I, I got to know Charlie Watts very well. And he, I love him. I mean, Charlie's one of the nicest guys. And he's got the best backbeat. A wonderful, wonderful backbeat. But such a gentle man. Ringo, I got to play with Ringo, obviously. I did a few tours. Oh, what that brings up uh, something we briefly touched on with, uh, with sobriety. Mm, and sure. you went through, you saw a lot um, as a teenager, 
And, and you mentioned that you were pretty much okay during all of that. Mm. What what kind of, when did it kind of go wrong? Because you'd watch Paul Kossoff go through that as well. You'd think in a way that'd be like, all right, I don't want to go, I don't want to go there um, is, is kind of a lesson. But things really, it must be tough on the road. How did, when did it kind of change for you where you realized exactly you needed? When it all went, as we say in England, when it all went pear-shaped <laughs> is when I got introduced to Coke. Okay. For sure. Because Coke uh, tripled, quadrupled my drinking. I had to take pills to go to sleep, la, 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 pills to wake up, yeah. another line, la, la, la. So in 1974, I, I did my first line and really the next 20 years, wow. yeah, it was real, real bad. So I, I stopped in 1996. Uh, I haven't had a drink for quite a few years and uh, I've had no, I don't touch, I wouldn't, you could hold a gun to my head and I wouldn't do a, another line of Coke. So, but in answer to your question, back in those days, Coke was like a currency. It was, everyone did it, yeah. everyone had it. And it was like a little bonding experience. It was just, that's, everyone did it in the 70s and 80s. Um, I stayed away from heroin, stayed away from opiates because those were the real killers. Still are, yeah. you know, and that's why "Shooting Star" is still such an appropriate song today. That Paul Rogers wrote, and here we are, forty years later. I mean, nearly fifty years later, and drugs are still a big, big problem. Um, I yeah, believe, I believe you were getting sober when you went out with Ringo too, and you described once that you kind of not owe, you kind of owed it to him to stay sober mm. and to kind of. Well, I just come out of rehab in '96. And I got a call from my, my daughter, came into my little studio in the apartment, said, yeah, Ringo Starr's on the, on the phone. And I thought she was kidding. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and said, Simon. I said, yes, it's Ringo. And, oh, ah. he said, look, you want to you come out on the road? I said, well, I'd love to. Uh, he said, I understand you just got out of rehab. You know, it's, we live in a small village, right? Everyone knows <laughs> everyone. I said, yes. He said, well, how do you feel about uh, playing sober? I said, oh, I'll give it a shot. And after the first show uh, in Seattle, I was in my room sweating and well, and Ringo called me and we both had, had a little cry because it was such a, an emotional uh, moment for me to be able to play sober. And um, and he's he's been a beacon of sobriety for God. 30, 40, him and Eric Clapton. Yeah. Those two, I think Eric uh, has been sober for nearly 40 years, maybe more. You're heavily involved in it. I think what's great is it's almost like you're paying it forward with new musicians uh, mm. with Recovery Road, I think it is. Road Recovery. Road Recovery. Yeah. How did you get involved? And I'd imagine, because um, I want to talk, we, have, we only have a, a little while left here. Mm. I, I want to touch briefly on, on your solo projects because mm. What inspired them? Because I think in rehab you were told you were actually said, "Hey, write a song. You know, to create something that oh, that yeah. will help you through this process." Well, they, they allow me to have a guitar yeah. as long as I sign something to the effect that I wouldn't <laughs> strangle myself with the with the strings. <laughs> it's a true story, um, and I wrote several uh, several songs uh, uh, about uh, recovery. It really helped me. And then when I got out, uh, I was in several rehabs, by the way. Uh, when I got out of my final one, um, I got in, put in touch with uh, Road Recovery, who's run by Gene Bowen and Jack Bookbinder, and it helps kids. Yeah. Primarily, it helps kids, teenagers in, and kids in their early 20s deal with uh, substance, uh, sexual abuse, wow. and uh, psychological abuse. And it's been going over 20 years now. And uh, it's a wonderful organization. When you um, and you got sober, when did you do your first solo record? Early 2000s, if not. Yeah. Well, I, I, it was called Seven Rays of Hope. And um, I, I did it in my basement. I recorded yeah. it myself. You know, it didn't really sell very much because there wasn't the social media that there is nowadays. Yeah. This was back in, um, God, 2005, yeah. I think. Uh, but it was it was like a cathartic exercise for me to get all these songs out, and um, I started doing solo shows. I I still I still do them, you know, when the pandemic will allow me. 
I, I love talking and telling stories and playing songs. No, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> was it a process of, did you attempt to do some solo stuff um, when you weren't sober? Because it seemed like no. timing was, okay. No, no. Just I was accidental. still very much involved with Bad Company. And my worst years were the first five years of, 90, of the 90s yeah. when Bad Company was still touring, albeit with another singer, uh, Robert Hart. And it was a good band, but yeah. we were all crazy. Now, I was curious if the solo stuff kind of helped you with your sobriety. Uh, without yeah. a doubt. Because kind of pour yourself into that yeah. as yeah. as the new, not to say new addiction that, in that's, a way. But, that's the new addiction, the yeah. healthy addiction, yeah. Is it interesting to go back, I think you did a ukulele cover on uh, one of, <laughs> is it I'm hard to up. resist well, um, I, the, I doing this, old uh, songs or? It, I was playing, uh, I was doing. Baby, when I think about you, I think about love. Darling, I can't live without you and your love. I feel like making, and my, my wife, Maria, said, oh, that's nice. You should, you know, is that one of yours? <laughs> <laughs> She's a little younger than me. Uh, and I said, no, no, it's a Bad Company song. It's a big hit from Bad Company. Yeah. And I was playing it on the ukulele. So she said, well, you should put it in your show. It's lovely. So I did this. Mm, nice. In that sort of reggae beat. And I was playing with this band called The, the Empty Pockets from Chicago, who played on the album. They're a wonderful band. And um, I had to get permission from Paul. And Mick Rouse, you know, yeah. would, would they mind if I did this, you know, reggae version of Feel Like Making Love? And they said, yeah, sure. They still got the royalties anyway. <laughs> let's do uh, let's do one more song before we wrap up. Yeah. That'd be um, great. Okay. Well, I want to do this. With Sam and Kirk here for Homegrown. Okay. One, two. She walks in beauty through the night With the moon and the stars around her When she smiles at me, my heart takes flight And I bless the day that I found her And I never felt more free Knowing Maria Lying in her arms I feel whole And I tremble before her In her heart she holds my very soul And there's nothing I wouldn't do for her And I never felt more free Loving Maria When I'm down, she knows what to say She clears my blindness away She walks in beauty With the sun and the moon around her In when she smiles at me My heart takes flight And I bless the day that I found her And I never felt more free, no Loving Maria, Maria, Maria. Very nice.
Nice. When did you meet Maria, out of curiosity? Because it sounds like you've had a, I'll say a renaissance over the past decade, but it feels like yeah. that from watching different interviews with you. It seems like you have a little bit of a, a different spark. I do. Uh, I met Maria thanks to Ronnie Wood, believe wow. it or not. I, uh, Maria was um, working at The Cutting Room, which is a great club in uh, New York. And Ronnie had asked me to play drums. Um, uh, we, we, we were there for three nights, and um, Ronnie Wood was doing a solo gig. And uh, my marriage, my previous marriage, was pretty much on the rocks. And uh, anyway, I, I walked in at about 6 o'clock to the cutting room um, for a sound check yeah. for the 8 o'clock show. And Maria was there behind the desk, and she was absolutely beautiful. And I kind of, my jaw dropped. And um, uh, I had the courage later on to go, you know, and introduce <laughs> myself. And we really, we clicked immediately. The only trouble was I was still married. And even though it was uh, heading, you know, uh, heading south quickly. Um, and we, we started seeing each other. Uh, my divorce came through. And we got married um, a couple of years later. Wow. And I wrote that for her. And I believe she sings too, right? She does. She's an actress. Uh, she writes plays and she sings. Very nice. There is so much we could still talk about. We have to wrap up. I know. As we do. Shame. I have heard a rumor, though, of a book. So have you been working I, on something? Yeah, or? I've written a book. I have written a book and I, I stopped writing it about six or seven years ago. It was 350 pages. <laughs> I could add to it. Uh, I probably will. I don't know. Um, we'll see. We're looking forward to uh, to what the future holds with that, and also hopefully getting some shows and you I back on so. the road uh, sometime soon. So thank so. you, Simon, so much. It's great chatting with you, getting to know you a bit, and we really appreciate it. And you're certainly, uh, it's great to have you out here on the East End of Long Island. Thank you, Harry. We uh, appreciate this we'll so do much. It again. Thank thanks you. to everyone. Thanks to Simon Kirk. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes here, Jason, Michael, uh, everyone here at LTV. We certainly appreciate. Uh, putting this whole thing together with Homegrown. And uh, thank you, and we look forward to the next time, and hopefully more with Simon down the road. Thank you so. so much. Thanks.